Good afternoon. Welcome to our daily Bible study. Today we'll be covering Psalms chapter 34 through 36. Good evening. Welcome to our Bible study today. Today we'll be covering Psalms chapter 34 through 36 and the Didache chapters 8 through 11. Um, let me check the sound. Chapters 8 through 11. Um, sound. Chapters 8 through 11. Let's, as we're waiting, we have a few jokes to share. Doctor, I think my wife is getting hard of hearing. There's a simple run, a test you can run to see how bad the problem is. Start out 40 feet away from her, and in a normal conversational speaking tone, say something and see if she hears you. If not, go 30 feet, then 20 feet, and so on until you get a response. That evening, the man's wife is in the kitchen cooking dinner, and he's in the living room. In a normal tone, he asks, Honey, what's for supper? No response. So he moves to the other end of the room and repeats, Honey, what's for supper? Still no response. Next he moves into the dining room. Honey, what's for supper? No response. So he walks up to the kitchen door. Honey, what's for supper? Again, there's no response. So he walks up right behind her. Honey, what's for supper? For the fifth time, Harry, chicken. A man walks into a rooftop bar and takes a seat next to another guy. What are you drinking? He asks the guy. Magic beer, he says. Oh yeah, what's so magical about it? Then he shows him. He drinks some beer, dives off the roof, flies around the building, then finally returns to his seat with, with a triumphant smile. Amazing, the man says. Let me try some of that. The man grabs the beer. He downs it, leaps off the roof, and plummets 15 stories to the ground. The bartender shakes his head. Superman, you're a real jerk when you're drunk. Let's start our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we pray for an end to this coronavirus pandemic. We pray for healing to the sick, health um, to all. We pray for wisdom to doctors, scientists, and leaders. We pray for peace in our families, peace for those who are lonely, afraid, sad, worried, angry, or stressed. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Now we're on Psalm 34 in the English Standard Version of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. First Samuel chapter 21 says to look there, verses 13 through 15. So who is Abimelech? We need that context before we can read this psalm. David went to the priest Ahimelech. Ahimelech. In Nob, Abimelech came out trembling to meet him and asked, why did you come here all by yourself? I am here on the king's business, David answered. He told me not to let anyone know what he sent me to do, 
As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what supplies do you have? Give me five loaves of bread or anything else you have. The priest said, I don't have any ordinary bread, only sacred bread. You can have it if your men haven't had sexual relations recently. Of course they haven't, answered David. My men always keep themselves ritually pure, even when we go out on an ordinary mission. How much more this time when we are on a special mission? So the priest gave David the sacred bread, because the only bread he had was the loaves offered to God, which had been removed from the sacred table and replaced by fresh bread. So there's a bread, it's called the bread of the face, or the bread of the presence, which is put in the temple. It's left there continuously, and every day new bread is put out. And at three o'clock, people are blessed with this bread. Saul's chief herdsman, Dog, who was from Edom, happened to be there that day because he had to fulfill a religious obligation. David said to Himelech, Do you have a spear or a sword you can give me? The king's orders made me leave in such a hurry that I didn't have time to get my sword or any other weapon. Ahimelech answered, I have the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in Elah Valley. It is behind the ephod, wrapped in a cloth. If you want it, take it. It's the only weapon here. Give it to me, David said. There is not a better sword anywhere. So David left, fleeing from Saul, and went to King Ashish of Goth. The king's official said to Ashish, isn't this David, the king of his country? This is the man about whom the women say as they danced, Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. Their words made a deep impression on David, and he became very much afraid of King Ashish. So whenever David was around them, he pretended to be insane and acted like a madman when they tried to restrain him. He would scribble on the city gates and let spit drool down his beard. So Yeshish said to his officials, Look, the man is crazy. Why did you bring him to me? Don't I have enough madmen already? Why bring another one to bother me with his crazy actions right here in my own house? Um, then... In chapter 22, verse 13, verse 11. So King Saul sent the priest to Himelech and all his sent for the priest to Himelech and all his relatives who were also priests in Nob, and they came to him. Saul said to Himelech, "Listen, Himelech, at your service, sir." He answered. Saul asked him, "Why are you and David plotting against me? Why did you give him some food and a sword and consult God for him? Now he has turned against me and waiting for a chance to kill me." Ahimelech answered, David is the most faithful officer you have. He is your own son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard, and highly respected by everyone in the royal court. Yes, I consulted God for him, and it wasn't the first time. As for plotting against you, your majesty, must your majesty not accuse me of anyone else in my family? I didn't know anything about this matter. Um, so we have here... Again, in Psalm 34 of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, so that he drove him out and went away. Um, this is, we're, we're talking about how he, he acted uh, differently, how he sought the help of Abimelech, um, and uh, asked for weapons, asked for food. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to see this const context which was he was running from Saul. So this is a poem that he wrote when he ran from Saul, when he had sought help from Abimelech, and was, then had to leave Abimelech. And it's also an acrostic poem. Uh, it's an acrostic. So each letter starts with the next letter of the alphabet, each line. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name 
together. So this is a song of praise. They are praising God. I sought the Lord and he answered me. So he went to the temple and in the temple he was able to get food and a sword. And he was able to get the best food, the food that was reserved for priests. And he was able to get the best sword, the sword of Goliath, who David himself had killed. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look at him, who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. When Moses goes to the top of the mountain and receives the Ten Commandments and he comes back down, his face is glowing. And people say, please cover your face because we are afraid. At the transfiguration, we see again Jesus in glory. And in the resurrection, they are unable to recognize Jesus because of the beauty of his face. The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. This is something that's fulfilled in the Eucharist. Um, David ate the bread of the face or the bread of the presence, which was kept in the temple before the presence of God. We are able to eat God himself in the Eucharist, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, you his holy ones. For those who fear him have no lack. Again, fear of the Lord, this idea, God is God and I am not. And so instead of trusting in my own strength, I will trust in God. The young lions suffer want and hunger. So people who are strong and young, even they cannot provide for themselves. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So now he's saying, all you who are younger, come and learn about the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? So everybody, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So how can you have many days in this life? By turning from evil, by keeping yourself pure, by seeking peace. Verse 15, chapter 34, verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the Lord. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. So God is faithful to those who are righteous. This is what David is pursuing. Um, but as we see in Jesus, the psalm is fulfilled in Jesus, when the righteous cry for help, so Jesus crying for help on the cross, what we see is not a saving from the cross, but the resurrection. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, Jesus says, for they will be comforted. So the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. If we are ever brokenhearted, we can take confidence in God. Say, God is near me because I am sad, because I am crushed. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So if you're righteous, you won't be free from affliction, but you will have God to deliver you from all of them. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. So there's no permanent damage from the afflictions of the righteous. There's no eternal damage. Affliction will slay the wicked. And those who hate the righteous will be condemned. So affliction for us is peace. For the wicked is destruction. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. So somebody, um, you have redemption. 
if your your firstborn donkey you were supposed to give to God, but you could redeem it by killing a sheep, a one year old male sheep. So the God redeems the life of his servants by offering another life in return. That life is his son. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. So even if we have sinned, if we take refuge in God, we will not be condemned. Psalm 35. Again, the introductory note of David. Contend, O Lord with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. David is saying, God, be on my side. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. A buckler, similar to a shield. It is a small round shield held by a handle or worn on the forearm. So you can have a shield that you would hold in your hand and then another one that's on your forearm, a buckler. Draw the spear and javelin. The javelin is like a spear. The other alternative translation is draw a spear and close the way. So draw a spear and, and come close to the enemy. Let destruction against my pursuers say to my soul, I am your salvation. So who says this to us? Who says this to our soul? Jesus says, I am your salvation. Let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be turned back and disappointed. Let them be like chaff before the wind. So chaff is the part of the wheat that you can't eat, but it's very flaky, like the skin of the wheat. And if you throw it, the, the wheat into the wind, the up, the wind will blow the chaff away with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery and the angel of the Lord pursuing them. So give them a dangerous path. Give me peace for without cause they hid their net for me, a net that you would use to catch an animal or in battle. They've hid it for him without cause. They dug a pit for my life. Again, something you might use in an animal or in a, in a battle. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it. And let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his destruction. So the person who's trying to kill me may it attack them by their own demise. Um, we can see this spiritually if uh, when we are tempted, we use the temptations not as a chance to turn to sin, but as a reminder to call upon the Lord. So then the devil who is trying to win a victory loses. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exalting in his salvation. So we've heard about the heart. We also hear about the soul, this core part of ourself. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you? delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. Jesus delivers us. God delivers us from those who are too strong for our own strength. Malicious or violent witnesses rise up. They ask me of things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. When we're under attack, there are always people ready to, um, there are always people ready to speak up against us, to condemn us. Oh, I knew he was bad, and yet God is on our side. Verse 13, but I, when they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. 
I prayed with head bowed on my chest. So we have this idea of um, enemies who are close to us, who we prayed for and cared for, and they have betrayed us. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother. As one who laments his mother, I bowed down in mourning. I prayed for them, I cared for them, and yet they have betrayed me. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and gathered. They gathered together against me, wretches whom I did not know, tore at me without ceasing, like profane mockers at a feast, they gnash at me with their teeth. So on Palm Sunday, we see people rejoicing, praising Jesus. A mere six days later, five days later, we see them saying, crucify him, crucify him. How fast the crowds have turned on this one who had loved and cared for them. How long, O Lord, will you look on? Again, we see this idea, how long? How long? This, this idea of, I know God will come, but I wish you would come sooner. Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng, I will praise you. So save me, and then I will tell everyone how great you are. Let not those who rejoice over me, who are wrongfully my foes, and let not those who wink the eye, who hate me without cause, for they do not speak peace. But against those who are quiet in the land, they devise words of deceit. They open wide their mouths against me. They say, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. So if we're righteous, those people who condemn us, don't let them have success. Verse 22, you have seen, O Lord, be not silent. O Lord, be not far from me. Sometimes it can feel that God is far from us. Even David, who has confidence that God is close, he says, it still feels like you are far because you are not saving. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication. We see Elijah, when he fights the prophets of Baal and challenges them to a sacrifice to see whose God will answer whose prayer, he says, maybe your God is sleeping. Yell louder, maybe you can wake him up. And yet we see this same idea in David. Lord, wake up. It feels like you're asleep. Um, we see this also fulfilled when Jesus is sleeping in the boat. And there's the storm all around. And the people say, Lord, wake up. Do you not know that we are perishing? And Jesus says, be still. And with one word, he silence, silences the waves. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, aha, our hearts desire. Let them not say we have swallowed him up, so like a lion might swallow up its prey. Let them be put to shame and disappoint. Let them be, let them be put to shame and disappointed altogether who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor, who magnify themselves against me. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor, who magnify themselves against me. So those people who exalt themselves, humble them. Jesus says the first will be last, and the last will be first. Let those who delight in my righteousness shout for joy and be glad. And say evermore, great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. Great is the Lord. So let those who are my friends rejoice and be glad. 
Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and your praise all the day long. So here in this song, we see this psalm, we see some more debating, negotiating between David and God. God, don't, I, I know you hear me. I know you've helped me in the past. I know you're capable. Don't wait. Don't rest. Don't be asleep. Show up now. Show the wicked that they are bad. And let us who are righteous rejoice. Psalm chapter 36. Again, there's a musical or liturgical note to the choir master of David, the servant of the Lord. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. Transgression means an act that goes against a law, rule, or code of conduct. And what this means, um, the wicked really resonate with sin and transgression. They really like it. Um, and we hear a lot of times people say, oh, this sin is something good. You'll hear it about abortion. You'll hear it about sexual sins. You'll hear it about euthanasia, you know, the killing of the elderly and the sick. They say this sin is something good. You'll hear it about uh, birth control. This sin is something good. And so we see in Psalm 36, transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flatters himself in his own eyes. Uh, another thing you'll say, the rich, the rich will say, oh, money is good. It is not bad for me to underpay my workers. There's no fear of God before his eyes. For he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. He says, oh, I'm so great. Look at me. Look at my success. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. So this person, they have so corrupted their conscience that they are entirely in favor of what is wicked. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sees himself in a way that is not good, that is not true. He does not reject evil. So he sees himself in a way that he shouldn't see himself. He doesn't see that he is wicked and in need of repentance. Rather, he sees himself as somebody who's successful, as somebody who's wise. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Um, his love is so big and so vast. Your faithfulness to the clouds, it's infinite. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Um, your righteousness is towering like the mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. So God is big. His righteousness, his faithfulness. Man and beast you save, O Lord. Chapter 36, verse 7. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Um, shadow of your wings. Jesus talks about Jerusalem gather wings. Matthew 27, verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Jesus is talking not about only about his life on earth, but over the hundreds of years um, of God's covenant with his people. 
how he so often longed to gather them. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. We see this same image. They feast on the abundance of your house. We feast how? On the Eucharist. You give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. What is the fountain of life? Baptism. In your light, we see light. Uh, we have this image of light. Jesus says, if their eyes are in darkness, how much more will the rest of them be? Um, if their eye is dark, Mark if your eyes are bad your whole body will be full of darkness um, this idea of, of um, Jesus is the light if we don't have that light we are in darkness oh continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright of heart let not the foot of arrogance come over me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the evildoer lie, evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. So let me rely on your love and your righteousness and not let me be proud, because pride is the way that leads to the downfall of the wicked and the evildoers. So let me trust in your love, let me be humble, rather than pride trusting in myself. That concludes our Psalms um, for the day. This is the Good News Translation. I, I reference it some. I've changed the format up a little bit. I, I'm not reading it in both texts. I, I figured this was... Um, a better way to do it. Uh, so now some jokes before we get to um, the Didache. Every 10 years, the monks in the monastery are allowed to break their vow of silence to speak two words. 10 years go by, and it's one monk's first chance. He thinks for a second before saying, food bad. 10 years later, he says, bed hard. It's the big day. A decade later, he gives the head monk a long stare and says, I quit. I'm not surprised, the head monk says. You've been complaining ever since you got here. Two pirates, Morty and Saul, meet in a bar. Saul has an eye patch over one eye, a hook for an a hand, and a wooden peg leg. Arr, matey, what happened to you? The pirate said, My pirate ship was attacked, and a lucky shot lopped off me leg. So now I got me a wooden peg. And your hand? When my ship sank, a shark bit me hand off. So now I got me a hook. Okay, but what about the eye patch? I was standing on a dock, and the biggest seagull I ever saw poops right in me eye. You don't go blind from that. True, said the pirate. But it was my first day with the hook. I was playing chess with my friends and said, let's make this interesting. So we stopped playing chess. A man comes to Miss Smith's door and says, 
there's been an accident at the brewery. Your husband fell into a vat of beer and drowned. Oh, the poor man, he never had a chance. The man says, I don't know about that. He got out three times to go to the bathroom. Okay, now the Didache. The Didache is Greek for teaching. The full name is the teaching of the 12 apostles. It was something that was written as early as 20 years after the time of Jesus, uh, after his death and resurrection. Um, and it is a, uh, a book that um, talks about common practice in the early Christian churches. Chapter 8, Fasting and Prayer, the Lord's Prayer. But let not your fasts be with the hypocrites. We're reading from our Syriac Spirituality Series, Volume 2. But let not your fasts be with the hypocrites, for they fast on the second and the fifth day of the week. So that would be Tuesday and Thursday. Rather fast on the fourth day and the preparation day, Friday. So the fourth day is Wednesday and the preparation day is Friday. So the traditional days for fasting in the church have always been Wednesday and Friday. Friday, you know, Wednesday is less common. Do not pray like the hypocrites, but rather as the Lord commanded in his gospel, like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily or needful bread. And forgive us our debt, as we also forgive our debtors. And bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, or evil. For thine is the power and the glory forever. So what do we say um, at Mass? For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. And if you look at Syriac, the Syriac word they say, min bisho. Menbisho, from the evil one. Um, so we see uh, both of these things that are preserved. So in the year 50, when people were praying the Our Father, they're saying, for thine is the power and the glory, or for thy, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. This um, doxology, or whatever you want to call it at the end, is uh, something that was a common ending for prayers at the time, uh, and an assumed ending. If you read Matthew or Luke, I believe, in their uh, telling of the Our Father, it does not include, for yours is the kingdom and the power and glory. And so some people say, well, that's because it was assumed. Because even in the year 50, it is something that is added to that prayer. Now he says, pray this prayer three times each day. So it, this Christian practice, so you'd have baptism. That was done in the same way that we do it today, 1950 years later, or 1900 years later. We regularly pray the Our Father like they did 1950 or 1900 years ago. And they fast, and they fast on Wednesdays and Fridays, like many Christians, uh, Catholic and Orthodox, continue to do. Pray this three times each day. So this idea of punctuating our day in prayer. Chapter 9. So we talked about baptism. We talked about fasting and prayer. What are we going to talk about next? Chapter 9. The Eucharist. Now concerning the Eucharist, give thanks this way. First concerning the cup. We thank thee, our Father, for the holy vine of David, thy servant, which you madest known to us through Jesus, thy servant, to thee be the glory forever. And concerning the broken bread, we thank thee, our Father, for the life and knowledge which you madest known to us through Jesus, thy servant. To thee be the glory forever. Even as this broken bread was scattered over the hills and was gathered together and became one, so let your church 
be gathered together from the ends of the earth into the kingdom. For yours is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ forever. So we see this ending. For yours is the kingdom and the power. For yours is the glory and the power. Thy and to thee be the glory forever. This same kind of ending that was added to the Our Father. But let no one eat or drink of your Eucharist unless they have been baptized into the name of the Lord. For concerning this also, the Lord has said, give not that which is holy to the dogs. So um, this is what Jesus says to the Syrophoenician woman. I cannot give the food of the children to the dogs. And Jesus says, yes, but even the crumbs, the dogs eat the crumbs. Um, so here we have this prayer, which is similar uh, to the preparation rite in the Eucharist, uh, in a Mass. So you have a liturgy in the year 50, 20 years after the resurrection. What are we reading about? We're reading about a liturgy. And it's a liturgy that is similar to the book of Revelations. It is a liturgy that is similar to what Paul talks about in Corinthians. It's a liturgy that is similar to what Jesus shows us in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It is a liturgy that is similar to the road to Emmaus story. It's a liturgy that is similar to what was done and practiced in the Old Testament. And it says, only give communion to those who have been baptized. And what does it say about baptism? Only baptize those who have turned from evil, the way of death, and have chosen the way of life. Chapter 10, prayer after communion. But after you are filled, give thanks this way. We thank you, Holy Father, for your holy name, which you did cause to tabernacle in our hearts. So in John... Chapter 1 said the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It means he built his tabernacle among us. So the same way that the word became flesh to live in the world, the world has become flesh to live in us. He caused to tabernacle in our hearts. And for the knowledge and faith and immortality, which you made known to us through Jesus. So through the Eucharist, through Jesus, through baptism, we have immortality and knowledge and faith. Jesus, thy servant, to you be the glory forever. You, Master Almighty, did create all things for your name's sake. You gave food and drink to men for enjoyment, that they might give thanks to you. But to us, you did freely give spiritual food and drink and life eternal through your servant. Before all things, we thank you that you are mighty. So it's interesting to see Jesus being called the servant. Um, yet we also uh, have the idea of the Trinity, that Jesus is God in the baptism. So this is just a way of uh, address that's not very common anymore. For Jesus, before all things, we thank you that you are mighty. To you be the glory forever. Remember, Lord, your church to deliver it from all evil and make it perfect in your love and gather it from the four winds, sanctified for your kingdom, which you have prepared for it. So the church, which is gathered from the whole world for the kingdom. So the church points us to the kingdom, points us to heaven. For yours is the power and the glory forever. Again, we see this ending prayer. Let grace come and let this world pass away. Hosanna to the, son, to the God, the son of David. Hosanna to God, son of David. If anyone is holy, let him come. If anyone is not so, let him repent. Maranatha means Lord come. Amen. But per permit the prophets to make thanksgiving, or Eucharist, as much as they desire. Either thanksgiving, uh, so it could be uh, about this act of giving thanks for the Eucharist, or it could be a reference to the Eucharist itself. Um, chapter 11. Concerning teachers, apostles, and prophets. 
Whosoever therefore comes and teaches you all these things that have been said before, receive him. So if they're teaching you what is true, receive him. But if the teacher himself turns and teaches another doctrine to the destruction of this, hear him not. So don't listen to false teachers. But if he teaches so as to increase righteousness and in the knowledge of the Lord, receive him as the Lord. So if he's teaching something good, receive him. If he's teaching something bad, cast him out. But concerning the apostles and prophets, act according to the decree of the gospel. Let every apostle who comes to you be received as the Lord, but he shall not remain more than one day or two days if there is a need. But if he remains three days, he is a false prophet. And when the apostle goes away, let him take nothing but bread until he lodges. If he asks for money, he is a false prophet. I really, I, I like this passage. Um, this idea of you have these churches and you have people who are visiting, going from place to place, preaching. And it says, if they ask for money, they are false. Um, so often we see people who use the gospel as a means for financial gain. Um, Paul talks about those who use the gospel for financial gain. Uh, in 1st Timothy chapter 6 5 um, so in 1st Timothy chapter 6 verse 3 if anyone teaches another doctrine and disagrees with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and with godly teaching he is conceited and understands nothing instead he has an unhealthy interest in controversies and semantics out of which come envy strife abusive talk evil suspicions and constant friction between men of depraved mind who are devoid of the truth. These men regard godliness as a means of gain. Of course, godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, so we cannot carry anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. Those who want to be rich, however, fall into temptations and become ensnared by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. By craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So Paul is saying something similar. There are people who are preaching the gospel as a way to make money. If somebody is preaching the gospel as a way to make money, if they're asking you for money, they're constantly saying, hey, let's take up a collection. Hey, let's get some money. Hey, I need this. I need that. They are false prophets. If he asks for money, he is a false prophet. And every prophet who speaks in the spirit, you shall neither try nor judge. For every sin shall be forgiven, but this sin shall not be forgiven. So those people who are, who are proclaiming the truth in the spirit, let them. But not everyone who speaks in the Spirit is a prophet, but only if he holds the ways of the Lord. So there are people who will say, going into a trance, I'm going to be speaking in the Spirit, but they're not living according to God. Therefore, from their ways shall the false prophets and the prophet, so the false prophet and the good prophet, be known. And every prophet who orders a meal in the Spirit does not eat it. So... You can imagine in his message, he says, give me some food. And he says, your life is like this hamburger and it's going to be crushed. Okay, that's fine. Strange, but fine. Unless he is indeed a false prophet. So if he asks for food, but he eats it, he's a false prophet. If he asks for food and does something else with it, he's not a false prophet. Um, or might not be a false prophet. And every prophet who teaches the truth 
but does not do what he teaches is a false prophet. So prophets, this idea they're people who are filled with the Spirit, who are going around, they're traveling preachers, but they're also expected to be people who are living upright lives. And every prophet proved true works unto, uh, working unto the mystery of the church in the world, yet not teaching others to do what he himself does, shall not be judged among you. For with God he has his judgment, for so did also the ancient prophets. But whoever says in the church, in the spirit, give me money or something else, you shall not listen to him. But if he tells you to give for others' sake who are in need, let no one judge him. So even today we have people who are not part of the church hierarchy, who are preachers. Um, there are some famous ones in, in the U.S. There is um, uh, Scott Hahn. There is, was Mother Angelica. Um, there is um, the people like this that they preach and they talk, but they're not bishops, they're not priests, they're not deacons. And so they could be analogous to the prophets of that day. Um, we will finish the rest of the Didache tomorrow. We'll see a little bit more about the Christian practices, including uh, a, a discussion on bishops and deacons. God bless all of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let me close again uh, with a joke. A guy goes ice fishing for the very first time. He brings out his drill, he starts drilling a hole in the ice. He hears a voice, there are no fish under the ice. He ignores it and moves to another area, cuts a hole and tosses his line in. Again, he hears the booming voice, there is no fish under the ice. He nervously looks up and asks, God, is that you? No, this is the rink manager.